Well, uh, we're recording right now. We'll we'll jump right into it. But um, we appreciate you coming on with us, man. Seriously, like we uh, obviously we admire what you do. Um, and you know, just for you making the time out to to talk to us is, is really big for us. So thank you. My pleasure. So let me introduce the podcast. This is episode sixty four of the Grindhouse Podcast. I'm your host Edwin Cabrera. To the left of me is my co-host Chris Martin, A.K. Critter. Hey guys, just real quick before we get into today's episode, uh, please like and sub- subscribe to our YouTube channel. It really helps us out. Also, um, if you want to support us, uh, buy our merch. Uh, it's super easy to get to, uh, grindhouse.store. Um, all right, let's get into today's episode. All right, so we have a big guest with us today. Uh, this person is the head of Upstream at DistroKid, former head of A&R at Good Music, former vice president of A&R at Warner Brothers, Amazing producer, had his hands all over the Grammy Award-winning album, The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill. He's worked with some of your favorite artists like Wyclef, Lauryn Hill, Dr. Dre, Kanye, ASAP Rocky, even uh, the film comp- composer Hans Zimmer. Uh, most, inform- most importantly, this dude's from Boston, so he's a, he's a, a homegrown talent. Uh, give it up for our homie, Shea Pope. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. Out here in sunny California, enjoying the sunshine. We're we're jealous because we're stuck here in the Boston area, freezing our asses off. Yeah, this is the first week we've actually got some sun. So, uh, Crit and I have been like doing a lot of running lately, trying to get like back in shape and whatnot after being uh, inside for a year. Uh, But yeah, it's been a long winter for us. Nice, nice, nice. Shout out to you know, yeah, still in Boston too. Word. Uh, So, you're from Boston. So, I actually, I I want to. Why don't you talk a little bit about like growing up in Boston, Um, maybe talk about like if there was like a hip hop scene um, and sort of like how you got started in music. Um, I really got started in music. You know, I had friends. We're all we were all into music. So I had a friend who was a DJ. You know, I bought a pair of turntables off of him when I think I was like 14. Um, But music was just everywhere for us. You know, we were we were big into sports at the time we were big basketball players. So it was like, you know, all about basketball and hip hop for us, you know, for the most part. And um, I think just being from Boston was an advantage, though, just in fact of you get an awareness of so many different types of music. You know, I I knew about rock. I knew about punk, you know, just you just learned. And obviously from my parents, I knew about soul and, and other things. So soul and some jazz. So I think I had this Boston gave me this really nice, like well informed um interest in music if that you know if that makes any sense what uh, what was the what was sort of like the scene like the hip-hop scene like like when you were growing up what, like what was that what did that look like well i mean i was uh i was a huge fan of gangstar and pre, you know primo and guru guru grew up on um the same block as my grandmother so his father who was a judge was good friends with my grandmother so i was already you know really in tune with what kind of what Primo and Guru were doing. Obviously in Boston, you had RSO, which later became Made Men. Um, So I knew knew some of those guys. You just can't be from the neighborhood and not know, you know, just some of what's going on. There was a famous record, local record store down um, the street from my house. Um, But this guy named Rusty the Toe Jammer used to have. Um, So he would go to New York, you know, like every week or every weekend, or, you know, maybe every two weeks. And he'd come back with mixtapes and stuff like that. You could just, you know, you'd just be in tune what was what was kind of going on or what was current in New York, or at least maybe like a couple, you know, a week or two behind. So you're pretty up on everything that was, you know, happening in New York. So, you know, that I think Boston not being that far from New York was was an advantage too, you know. So we weren't, you know, we were still pretty up to up to speed on everything. Yeah. W- were there like venues and stuff like holding like hip hop shows? Yeah, you know, I mean, the the bigger ones with the Worcester Centrum, um, there was definitely this one. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Um, I'm old, <laughs> um, but there's my friend would remember. My, my friends would remember it off the top of their head. Yeah. But there's definitely was a like a smaller venue too that was really cool because I mean that was part of it. Like right, getting able to see. I think some of my first hip hop shows were like KRS One and Ice Cube when Ice Cube first went solo. And, um, you know, so that that was a big part of it, too, just going to the shows and being able to see it first, in, you know, in person and kind of like really brought it to life for me, too. You know, Word. 
Dope. So uh, you actually went from Boston to Virginia, right? Where the, there was yep. a, a much bigger music scene over there. Um, and you were able to be a part of something great. I think you got connected with Teddy Riley down there. Um, and you were able to, um, you know, kind of put your footing in the music scene. Can you talk a little bit more about what that music scene was down there and what, uh, what elements did that sort of uh, uh, bring? I really think that's just life timing. I wouldn't say that the music scene was bigger than Boston or anything like that. I don't think that necessarily Virginia had this music scene any different than like Boston did, meaning it was just up and comers. But it just so happened, you know, it's almost like serendipity, right, that Teddy Riley happened to relocate and set up shop there. You know what I mean? It's just like if Teddy Riley had moved from New York and set up shop in Boston and just so chose he liked the Virginia Beach area. So that's where he chose to set up shop. And um, I think um, where, where I went to school was Hampton University, which was, um, you know, prestigious black college. And that's also the area where I, I was finished from. So the timing was just, you know, I think timing was everything. I think the location brought all this stuff going on, good and bad. So for instance, the good stuff, meaning Timberland, Pharrell and Chad and Missy were all from this area, right? So they were all about, they were all embarking on their careers. Um, you know, so that was happening, even though like Timbaland and Missy actually ended up going up to upstate New York with, with Devante. So, but they had obviously started in VA and then they came back to VA, you know what I mean? Really set up shop. Um, Chad and Pharrell signed to Teddy, you know, they started with Teddy too. So Teddy just really brought, and there was just so many people that came through Teddy, Rodney Jerk, it's all these people that were around that are still around today. You know, it came through, they came through Teddy's spot. So they had this melting pot. But then I also think just like Hampton being HSB, you know, being a um, historical black college just brought a lot of people in that area, meaning rappers toured there, right? They would have shows, it would be one of their tour stops. So I met a lot of rappers earlier. Um, on the bad side of it, what I was saying, you know, a lot of people came down and were selling drugs down there because, you know, that's what New York and D.C. people did. And but that still brought more New York people down there. So, you know, I met Buster Rhymes. I, bought, I met RZA. I met Naughty by Nature. You know, I met all these people in Hampton. So I think that was just the uniqueness about Hampton, especially at that time. You know, Iverson, when I first got I was a freshman. Iverson was a junior in high school. Like his games were like NBA games. Like everybody would go to his games like it was the club because he was the you know, everybody was talking about this phenom. You know what I mean? So it just was a night. It was just a sort of all these things happening and that, that created opportunity, you know? Awesome. I, so I want to ask you just a, a question about an earlier, uh, I guess, startup that you had uh, called Cops and Robbers, just because like <laughs> I was hearing you talk about that um, and it just reminded us of like what we're trying to do with Grindhouse. We don't necessarily have all the resources in the world, but obviously we have like a vision um, that we feel like is like not just the two of us creating something, but our community itself, the, the Lint Hip Hop community, I think we have a, a, a lot of talent in and we're all trying to sort of pull our resources and knowledge together to create something bigger than ourselves. And so I was hearing you talk about cops and robbers and just like going into that. And I just want to hear um, what that startup was about um, and just how are you able to sort of build from there? And obviously, you know, you've gone to have a very successful career from since then. But I want to hear about the beginnings. Um, well, Cops and Robbers was actually between Dre and Kanye years. So I, but I, I would, I would say this first and foremost, I always knew I wanted to um, start something. You know what I mean? I knew I wanted to build something where I could really help artists and work with artists and grow a business and not, but not, but you know, never be pigeonholed because, you know, people, when you say like, if you put a label on something, people always try to pigeonhole you into a business of what you can and cannot do. Um, so cops and robbers, like, a, um, the latter years in Dre were like, I saw Dre really searching for something else. This is prior to beats, right? Even before beats, he was looking at vodka. He was looking at sneakers. He was looking at other, all these different other opportunities. Um, I'm going to go get my charges just so I don't lose you guys. Um, but, um, he, um, sorry, give me one second. Um, so that alone, just him, you know, the, and, and Dre used to let me come to meetings with him and Jimmy. 
So I could join, you know, it'd be, it'd be like a meeting at Jimmy Iovine's house and it'd just be Dre, you know, me, Dre and Jimmy. And I could just be a fly on the wall and listen to these guys talk. And these are guys who made, you know, a ton of money in the music business, but they were always looking at these other opportunities, right? Because at the time, this was when piracy was, was at an all time high and some of the money that they were used to making, you know, started drying up a little bit. So they were looking at other resources, you know, other opportunities. So for me, that was, that was very insightful because I was able to be like, okay, you know, if these guys that are like, to me, like the kings of the music business are looking for new avenues of making money, then I need to be, you know, if I want to build a company and I want to be a young entrepreneur, I need to be doing the same. And I just got to see, I'm not Dr. Dre, so I got to figure out, okay, what's, how does, how does that work for Che? You know what I mean? What's, what's the Che way of doing that? And so that's where Cops and Robbers came. And I had a friend who, was, who had married into the Campbell Soup family who also wanted to get in the music business. So, you, you know, that's where Cops and Robbers came. And I would say in its, orig in, in its original form, it was some form of a futuristic label. You know what I mean? I, I think I, I was always had the insight to be like, okay, I'm not just gonna be, you know, I gotta be much more than a record label. I've always actually looked at the, I've always actually looked at the word record label in as we entered the, sort of the modern future business as meaning as we've gotten into the streaming business and this and that, I've always looked at the word record label as something like somebody trying to pigeonhole you or diminish you. I've actually looked at it as more of an insult than a compliment. So even now when people say, like I have a startup, you know, a company called Workshop that I'm building. Even now when people call it a, label, a record label, I get offended. Um, because in 2021, to me, if you're starting a record label, you're, you're limiting yourself and you're putting yourself in a little box when people are going to keep you in this little box. So I'm very particular about how I describe the company. And I think I always had the insight even then. Even, you know, because Cops and Robbers was maybe 2009, maybe 2008, somewhere around there, maybe 2009, 2010. And I still have Robbers, like I still have Robbers, it's still one of my companies. I dropped the cop because we're no longer partners, so. Um, did, I hope you, did you actually want to talk about uh, Workshop a little bit? Uh, like not not too much not yet okay <laughs> I, I put a little i put a little bit out there here and there at the end of the day i just say it's a new company that i'm starting um it's a lot to it um i will i will tease more and more about it as 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 time goes on you know what i mean i have talked about it a little bit in my you know in my on my uh, temperature checks and different things like that but um it's not something i'm talking too much about publicly right now Word. Actually, I have a question about uh, NFTs. Are you are you uh, on NFTs at all or hip to NFTs? I've been hip to NFTs since 2017. Perfect. So I, I'm asking the perfect person about this. What do you think uh, the NFTs will do for the music industry and more importantly for independent artists? Um, um, NFTs are really it's really about your your own creativity and your innovation with business because, like anything, it's like a website, you could go get a GoDaddy website, right? But without the right marketing, without without the right interest, no one's going to go to your website. It's the same with your NFT. Without really, however you, whatever your strategy is, without that, there's really no value to your NFT. You know what I mean? If you don't, especially as an emerging artist, you know, if you're established artist, obviously there's built-in value right there already because you have an audience, you have a fan base, so on and so forth. But if you're a new artist, there's really no interest in there unless you build that, unless you build like this, where people are looking at it like, wow, this artist has amazing potential. This artist has a and that's when the, that's when it becomes value because you, however you built that mystique, you've done it in a way that people can say like, oh, I want to invest in this. You know, what I mean, I think this person is gonna be, you know, somebody. So that's kind of the way. But in terms of how it can impact the music business, is is a really interesting way that can happen. Um, you know, streaming, I, I, I think of sh streaming as the shrinking of the song value. If you think of when CDs were out, right, song values were almost at all time high, right? Remember when a CD was like eighteen ninety nine, right, before before they went down to like nine ninety nine. Yeah. But 
even when they were 1899, then iTunes comes along, right? And then a song becomes, you know, 99 cents, which is really 69 cents minus the 30% iTunes commission, right? So now the song, that individual song from being at an all time high has dwindled to, you know, 69%, 69 cents. Now, if you think of streaming, it's dwindled even that it's got mashed down that much further. What the NFTs can do is it can regulate that too. I mean, don't get me wrong. The bubble is going to burst in NFTs. Everyone's going to kind of get over the popularity of it. You know, they're just discovering it. It's been around since crypto kitties, you know, digital collectibles. It's just that people kind of discover what they can do with it sometimes later in life. Right. Then, then this bubble will burst. Maybe it'll stay around in the art world longer than the music world. Maybe not go away completely but the bubble will burst right where you know everyone's everyone and their mother is doing an nft right now that'll calm down but what i do think is it can take that song that i'm talking about that individual song value and bring some value back to it and that's what i'm excited to see you know if somebody's going to create some kind of innovative platform that's going to combine nft and streaming and it's going to bring value back to it and that's what we need because right now we don't, it's almost like casinos, right? Where it's like Spotify and Apple, like, well, we're the biggest game in town. You got to come play here. If you don't come play at our casino, it's like you're missing out. And to some extent, they're right. NFTs can help regulate that, right? Let's Speaking hypothetically, let's just say someone like a Travis just purely went to NFT releases and didn't play in that, decided not to play in that league anymore. He, he didn't want to play in the NBA anymore. He's like, I'm starting my own league over here. You know what I mean? And then obviously more artists doing that. So that just helps level, you know, just regulate things. Yeah, I agree. I, I call agree. it the I call it the reckoning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm excited exactly for what you were saying. The, the, like the streaming, like, uh, you know, adopting blockchain technology into a streaming platform. Um, you know, I'm excited for that future. I know that future is possible. So I'm just waiting for it to happen. I'm excited for that. But uh, thank you for answering that yeah. question. It was great. Sure. Uh, yeah. To, to stay on more of the, the financial stuff, um, do you have advice for like artists that you know are lacking the money and the resources? Um, what's the sort of the best way to get into the industry? Um, there's you know, I always tell people this there's no right way, right? The, there's, there's only right and wrong, meaning wrong is if it didn't work, it was wrong, <laughs> you know what I mean? But right is anything that, um, you know, works. And, and with that said, when there's no resources, I look at it this way. I look at it. What is at your disposal? What is at your fingertips? You know what I mean? Social, um, being clever with, you know, pitching blogs and playlists and so on and so forth. So when you have no resources. You have to apply pressure in, on, in every lane. You know what I mean? There shouldn't be a social platform you should not be on. You know what I mean? Like you should have a Discord channel. You should have a TikTok. You should have a Triller. You should have a Twitch. You should have Instagram. Tw you know, Twit. You know, Snap. You should be on all of them because those are things that are within your reach. And if you're an artist, you just have to be clever. You have to be clever in terms of like pitching influencers, getting people to support you, building your fan base. Um, then, what happens with any bit of traction? You get on a playlist, this and that. Now you can start getting to the companies that provide resources the A walls, the human resources, the platoons, United Masters in some case, even though their deals aren't, you know, amazing, but um, they do provide resources, Empire as well. You know, you can start getting these companies where you can get a marketing budget. And once you get a marketing budget, then that's where you can try to get, you know, numbers. You know what I mean? Um, and the same thing, you have to be clever with how you use the marketing budget. You know what I mean? You have to be clever. You can't just blow the money. You have to be very, very strategic in terms of like, am I using influence? Am I spending this with influences? You know, don't go to one of those playlist sites where they you pay for playlists. That's that's a lot of that's fraud too. So you don't want to get fraud because then you get pulled down. So honestly, it's really part of your own creativity. You know what I mean? Get out there, create TikTok dances, create TikTok challenges, create snaps. Be just be creative as innovative as you can. And don't get me wrong, some artists really. Um, struggle with that right they're not social media savvy they're really amazing artists but because they're not social media savvy they're at a disadvantage so sometimes a mediocre artist can get more traction because they're so good at social media so but that's honestly that's the world we're playing in. it's a numbers game you know 
Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I just to, to add to that, I feel like I've seen a lot of times where like maybe because the artist is more about themselves and they necessarily are about their music, I feel like they're better at marketing themselves and an artist that's more about their art than than marketing themselves, you know? So it's, it's kind of funny how that works yeah. out sometimes. Um, and I feel like just to bounce yeah. off of that, I feel like that's why, you know, I, just to follow up on that question, you know, there are artists I feel like that need more platforms available to them that aren't necessarily there until you've hit a certain level. But there are also yeah. different, re th th like, for example, YouTube is a thing now where you don't necessarily need a high budget and you can have a large following. I mean, you, you look at how DJ Academic started, you know, doing yeah. what he did. And he, he has a, say what you will about, you know, you know, one way or the other, how you feel yeah. about him. But he has a large following that, I mean, he created just using, you know, the resources available to him as in YouTube. So I do think that for the small person, there is an avenue to, to get their, you know, obviously the product out there. Um, I feel like just focusing on what's happening in, in our neck of the woods out here in, in Lynn Mass, I think there's a lot of talent out here, but there is like a, a, a shortcoming of the supportive background people. And that's where kind of we come in. Obviously, we do this podcast trying to get people on or, or at least trying to get people to see, hey, these are people you, that's worth checking out. You know, business advice like we're getting from you, like having different perspectives and different ways of, of I don't know, get, sharing that information now and also putting people on. Um, is there, in terms of that sort of more communal um, role playing, you know, where it's not just I'm a rapper, so, you know, I'm trying to do all this, but like if you're not a rapper necessarily, maybe you're more of a, a camera person or, or I don't know, a journalist or whatever. What you, do you have any advice for what can those people outside of just the rappers can do to uplift the, uh, I don't know, the culture, the community? Well, that's that's what's important, right? Meaning you got to build that sort of that community approach to it, meaning. For instance, Atlanta, right? Atlanta, Atlanta radio supports emerging artists. Obviously, the strip clubs are big with local artists. I mean, you know, there's obviously some money being exchanged here and there, but at the end of the day, Atlanta puts Atlanta artists on. You know what I mean? It's, it doesn't wait for the internet or the world to discover them. You know, Atlanta artists can become popular in Atlanta. You know, um, I can remember being down there before anybody had heard of Future, and this kid, this unknown guy, is all over the radio. You know what I mean? So speaking to the other talents, I think it's kind of about creating like things like yourself, what you're doing. But when you're creating these, these companies or institutions or, or, or even, you know, crews or whatever, it's, it's about thinking about the full, the, you know, the full 360 of what's needed. So for instance, for workshop, you know, I'm going to have full-time content people on, on staff, you know, uh, you know, full-time videographers, you know, and so on and so forth, because you need every element of the of the piece of the puzzle, right? So meaning you need marketing people, you need people that can shoot, edit video, you need people that can produce and make the music and engineer in the studio, mix the records, you know, and you need people that can you know, definitely be out there with their bullhorn, you know what I mean? And, and, and you know, those are mean like the relationship people, meaning the people that are knocking on the radio's doors, knocking on brands' doors, you know, and that's all from the community. You can have all that within the community, you know? Dope, yeah, I agree. I actually, we're working on something right now. This is kind of an idea that I came about because um, just off of the, you know, we have a lot of artists, a lot of talent, maybe not necessarily the, the larger community support. Like I think for the most part, people in Massachusetts, Boston, Lynn, I think they still look at the mainstream talent as like, this is the people I'm looking to listen to. And so we yeah. had this idea of um, creating this, uh, we call it like a mural slash award because it's going to be a mural where it's uh, going to dedicate the top, like it's going to be like a yearly ceremony, but essentially a mural is going to be created with uh, first just like 30 people who will get inducted, the top 10 rappers, top 10 producers, top five battle rappers, top five influencers, and open it up to the community to vote like who should be recognized as the best from this community. Hopefully. Yeah creating some sort of debate, some sort of like, uh, you know, engagement with the community of who they think is the best and, and, and creating that sort of like, I don't know, like, I feel like once that, once that level of debate is being created, the more buzz is being created around just the, the, the culture in general. And I think good things can from, come of it. Um, yeah. But is there, has, have you ever experienced any sort of community or, or what ideas have, have maybe you come across in terms of community engagement, trying to get the people to really connect with the artist that is literally right in front of them, as opposed to somebody who is, you know, a, 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 on the other side of the coast. I mean, I've always been a firm believer. I mean, mind you, there are no rules to this, this game anymore, but I've always still been a firm believer that you got to get your hometown or where you're from 
first and foremost. Those need to be, because that's your foundation, right? That gives you a foundation. Like, let me give you an example. Designer had this skyrocketing song, Panda, right? But I felt like he really needed to um, just secure Brooklyn. Brooklyn is such a loyal fan base, right? You know, Brooklyn is everything that stood on, Biggie stood on Brooklyn's shoulders. Jay-Z stood on Brooklyn's shoulders. Pop Smoke, you know what I mean? All these people. So I felt like that was so necessary. So I still, I'm a firm believer in you've got to get where you're from to really hold you down. Because that's the ones when, you know, let's say you get cold. Those are the ones that still, you know, like he can be this hot rapper. But if, if you have this loyal fan base, they're the ones that are still going to support you through your ups and your downs, you know. So you through your trials and your tribulations. So in terms of strategies to do it, you just got to build. Um, what everybody, you know, people like to put obstacles in their way and all these reasons of why they cannot do. And it's like, no, you really can do. And, and you just got to do. And yeah, you might make some missteps. You might you might turn left and then back, figure out you got to back up and turn around and go right. You know, I'm living proof of that. But it doesn't mean you can't get it done. You can. You just got to be, you got to see it through. You can't, you know, and you got to, um, you do have to get out of your comfort zone. I think that's one thing that people don't realize, whether it's community engagement or just business engagement, period. Meaning if you want to be in this business of entertainment, it is very necessary to network. It's very necessary to build relationships. It is a very relationship-driven business. Opportunities come from relationships. You know, so going back to me, you know, I mean, I'm a firm believer. Any artist I sign, it doesn't matter where they're from, I'm going to have them repping that city. I'm going to have them wearing those sports teams, you know, creating merch that's just for their city. Very, very localized merch. Really, you know, supporting their community, whether it's, through local shows, you know, visiting high schools, visiting middle schools, you know what I mean? Like really, because it's just, you got to connect on all levels. And, you know, that to me is part of any rollout for any artist that I have, you know what I mean? Like for instance, right now, I manage a young lady who's from Columbus, Ohio. One of the first things I'm trying to do is connect her with the Cavs. You know what I mean? Like I just got to really engage her with, you know, everything that can be, because then if I can get the Cavs supporting her, you know, it's like, okay, cool. Even if, you know, they're, you know, putting her in their marketing materials. Now she's getting millions of impressions, you know, even though she's from Columbus, Ohio, Please where she's not in two. any kind of major market, you know. Could you repeat uh, that? Really? You couldn't have just typed it Pardon? in, bro? Like, really? Sorry. I'm sorry. Sometimes I seem to be somewhat hard of hearing. Oh. My son decided to talk to the car in the middle of the. Anyway, um, no worries. No. I dig, I digress. Um, <laughs> so, I want to talk about. Um, uh, so, a lot of artists that we've worked with or even interviewed, a lot of them you use uh, DistroKid, um, yep. and you're leading the pack there for uh, this thing called Upstream. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that can help artists? Well, I mean, one of the things you have to do, I, I call it the void. There's an area between being a new artist and then signing to a major label. I call it the void. And one of the things you have to do is you have to create interest and you have to create resources in this void because that's it, there's a lot of companies that work in the void, right? Human resources and AWOL would be companies that I would say work in the void. You know, new startups like Music Breaker and some of these things that work in the void, right? The more tools that you see created for emerging artists, you know, STEM and all these companies, they work in the void. DistroKid is one of those. So considering that DistroKid is the number one independent distributor of music in the world by far, you know, it's a great, there's a great opportunity there. There's so many artists there to create interest for these artists. Um, everybody wants the data, right? Every label wants data. They want the competitive advantage against their competitors, right? They, they want, so it's like, hey, if we can get this DistroKid data, we can see who's, you know, who's growing, who's doing this, who's doing numbers. So the founder of DistroKid never wanted to necessarily, he wasn't really, he didn't necessarily care whether, you know, this label or that label have an advantage. He always wanted to create opportunities for artists on DistroKid. You know, those are, that's the heart and soul of DistroKid. It, it's its artist. So um, you can think of Upstream as almost like a matchmaking service. And it's about, 
bringing awareness to the you know all these labels so for instance if you're a label how is it an advantage yeah you, you you get a tool that you'll be able to you know search the data and you know you'll be able to customize it a little bit in terms of you know kind of like zillow you know where you can filter you know same thing like a matchmaking service you know you want a blonde with blue eyes you know whatever blah 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 in this region of the country so very very similar and now for artists though instead of two labels finding out about you maybe 200 labels find out about you. So you're, you're creating this interest and you're creating this leverage. Now you still have to be an artist that's doing something, right? Meaning how are they gonna find you if you don't fit their search criteria? So you still have to be, you know, you, you still have to be doing something in some sort of leveling up because it is still a numbers game, but this gives you more opportunities just, you know, and that's the whole idea is to you just create more interest and more opportunities for everybody. I have a question just uh, sort of about your upbringing. Your, your parents are educated, right? My, my, my mother and stepmother were in the legal field, and then my father was edu in the educator. Gotcha, gotcha. I, I have a question about just like, you know, growing up with, uh, you know, a uh, uh, family background with like educators in the household. Do you think that any of that, like, I don't know, the relationship, you know, between somebody who can, who's has a background in teaching, do you, th do you feel like that has helped any of, uh, uh, your abilities to sort of like watch, observe, learn from people like you were talking about Jimmy Iovine and Dre learning from them being a fly on the wall. Do you feel like any of those skills were attributed to just, you know, the coachability of like, you know, growing up and having, you know, the parents being there and sort of guiding you a little bit? Well, definitely. I think I was I was heavily influenced by my parents and my grandparents. Um, you know, my father, my grandfather was a very influential guy on me in terms of, um, you know, he came from Alabama, moved to Boston, you know, 49 cents in his pocket you know, really built something, was a serial entrepreneur, you know, worked 40 years at General Electric, but also was a serial entrepreneur. My father was a history professor, but also, you know, and, you know, serial entrepreneur as well. So I think they instilled um, quite a bit of things in me, like work ethic, first of all. But, you know, the curiosity, I think one of my biggest strong suits is curiosity, meaning curiosity about learning, curiosity about constant, you know, growth and um information so um that's the biggest thing i think my parents you know really gave me that you know they, did, they didn't they didn't they didn't they never held me back they always you know anything's possible with them and when you when you empower a child with that that they can believe anything is possible look you get a kanye right you get you get a dre you get a you know i mean dre was from compton but you know if he hadn't been a, a rap producer he was going to be a mechanical engineer you know what i mean so you just believe I think when you can plant and plant something in someone's mind at a young age, then they realize that anything is possible. I, I you know, I meet a lot of kids through, a, you know, I lecture and I talk and I meet a lot of kids and I can just tell from certain kids, sometimes they just don't even think that these next steps are even possible. They don't even see, they don't connect the dots. They don't see a way that those dots connect. You know, they just think, you know, oh, I'm going to end up in some dead end job that I'm going to hate. And they don't even see the, the the connection to the possibility. And I think you have to implant that that anything is possible if you know if you really put your mind to it and you're really willing to do the work. All right, thank you. Um, so I hear that you're a fan of punk music. Um, so has that influenced uh, you know your how you produce like sound wise or or even like uh, you know how you conduct business or anything like that. Well, I mean, I think in general, my attitude is always punk and hip hop. I come from that, you know, I come from the culture, you know what I mean? I come from, I mean, I necessarily don't want to, you know, I'm fortunate enough that I've been able to make a living to not, um, that my kids didn't have to grow up in a like, you know, a hood environment, if you will. But there is some, there's some amazing things that growing up in a hood environment instilling somebody, right? you get these sort of instincts and you get this sort of edge, you know I mean? Whether you want to call it a chip on the shoulder, whether you want, especially coming from Boston, Definitely. right? In my case, Roxbury and Dor Dorchester, you know, I went to high school in Brookline and middle school in Brookline, but I lived in Dorchester and Boston, you know? So there's definitely something that comes from just even going to the park to play basketball and, you know, and being able to like hold your necks without someone taking your necks from you. You know, you just you just built a certain way, and 
I think of that attitude as very punk and very hip hop. And it, it, it definitely boils over into my music. It definitely boils over into my life and, you know, and, you know, try to instill that in my kids, even though they're not raised in that environment, I still try to instill, you know, that, that confidence in them, that quiet, you know, confidence in, you know, you know, we ain't getting, you know, and that's what I, and that's what I think of punk, you know what I mean? From how you dress to how you carry yourself, you know, and so on and so forth. So, so punk to me is, and hip hop is more than just about the music. It's, it's so much more. I, uh, I'm just, uh, the, the last response really, really touched me just as uh, somebody who's an educator and also somebody who's like, I've experienced, I work with a lot of youth and uh, uh, like the high school level. Yeah. I'm a film teacher, so I teach a lot of film photography. Um, and like, w like you were saying before, I feel like some of the times like that some kids, like they'll come up with genius ideas, absolute great ideas. And I'll tell them it's a great idea, but because they don't necessarily receive support or not that used to hearing supportive words, sometimes it becomes sort of self-sabotage and so yeah. you know i want to like just like i look at somebody like um you know just talking about like looking at what kanye was able to do with yeezy and how he was able to trust in his own vision believe in his own vision um you know i think a number of years ago he was in debt i think they were saying like something around 50 million ish 54 million 54 million 54 million and, you know, now the other last week, the whole conversation is how many billions does Kanye have? So, you know, he goes yeah. from, you know, having tabloids talk about, you know, how negative he's in the millions to how many billions, you know, all because he was able to b believe in himself and, and, and really follow through with his vision. Um, and you were part of that also. You were able to, to sort of like get Kanye connected with Adidas. I want to just yeah. talk more about just that, how that all, all came about and, and how it worked as well as it did. Um. I mean, I always thought the guy had tremendous influence, period, just influence, right? So when I started working with Kanye, um, I had a friend, a Middle Eastern guy who was a billionaire, was a friend of mine. And I had basically talked him into letting me have $7 million to invest in something. And the $7 million, I, I was literally like, all right, what would I invest $7 million in? I, you know, I was like, I'll invest $7 million into... <laughs> Kanye, you know what I mean? Some, something in fashion with Kanye. So when I went to meet with him and he was doing, he was putting together this fashion show and he had this fashion office in London, this and that. Unbeknownst to me, he had no idea about a business. He just was putting on a fashion show. So there was no business plan. There was no anything. There was no infrastructure. So of course the investor was like, hey, I'm not investing $7 million with no business plan, no nothing, this and that. So, you know, we kept talking. And, um, and then Kanye was like, well, I got this label. You want if you can, you want to help me with that? And that's how I ended up working with good music. But really what I had met with him about was about bringing investment into his fashion brand. So I never kind of lost sight of his influence. So um, one day we were at his apartment in New York and he was complaining about Nike and how he felt disrespected by Nike. And in terms of the type of deal he had and the structure of the deal, and the limitations with it so being from boston you know adidas was a big part of my childhood right and especially pre-jordan um boston was all about adidas especially in my neighborhood and then jordan kind of changed everything but so i suggested adidas i had a, a a childhood friend who was an executive at reebok um so i had suggested adidas and so kanye was like hey i don't like adidas adidas is corny and I was like, Adidas isn't corny. Adidas was the shit. Like, Adidas was the first ones to embrace hip hop. You know, everything, Run DMC and the Shelters and blah, blah. And so I started talking to him about it. And then I, you're the one who makes, you know, you decide whether something is the shit or not. You know what I'm saying? So I kept driving it home. And then finally he was like, and I put him on, on the phone with my friend Todd, who's still an executive at Reebok this day. Todd Krinsky, one of the top executives at Reebok. I put him on the phone with Todd. Todd kind of re reaffirmed kind of what I was saying. And then, so then Kanye was like, all right, make the call. You know what I mean? So I literally cold called this, the worldwide CMO of Adidas at the time. It was a guy named Herm, Herman Derringer, who has um, sent, oh, I got to give a rest in peace because he passed away suddenly a couple, uh, maybe a year or two back. Um, but I mean, I literally called this guy out of the blue. And this guy was like, 
what, who, like, who are you? Like, why are you calling me? Like, and then, you know, I brought up Kanye West. He was like, oh, man, this Kanye guy's trouble. And I was like, no, man, you know, this guy, man, this guy is the, is the future of, you know, footwear and fashion, da, 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 you know, I'm talking all my, and finally I talked him into coming to a Watch the Throne show. And then that, and that's how it all started. You know, I got him to come to Watch the Throne show. The first, the first time they met did not go well. Um, so I actually convinced him to come to a second show. Um, and the second show went much better after the show. We had a really great meeting. Um, it really went well. Um, awesome. Yeah. By the way, it, it looks nice. You know. Gary, I wonder if we can just yeah. ask them if they can give us a Well, maybe just call. Isn't there a number? Excuse me, guys. Um, so, you know, the first meeting, I think, you know, we met directly after the show, and I didn't think about the adrenaline and the things that goes on in a show. And then an artist really having to come down from the adrenaline. So I think the first meeting was too soon after the show where he was still full of adrenaline and the meeting just went all bad. The second meeting, we did it after the show later on at the hotel when, you know, and it just, everybody was calm. And that meeting lasted till about three in the morning. So, you know, and the show probably ended maybe like 11. We probably did the meeting at 12, like 12 to three. And then, you know, the rest is history, you know? So. Awesome. that's that you know so it's just same thing it's just honestly maybe it's a little bit part delusion part confidence part whatever but you know like i you know i was fearless i mean you know i make those kind of calls or try those kind of things all the time i still do it you know showing up on hans in his doorstep you know what i mean like i just showed up on his doorstep you know so you just have to you have to take those chances in this business because only good things can come of yeah you're gonna get some doors slammed in your face phones hung up on you and you know and all that but you know you just gotta have resilience and you know i always shout out this book the third door it's a really good book say it's, it's about it's literally about that if, if the opportunities feel like they got closed on you know you know you, you find that third door if the front door is closed the back door is closed you still find you find that third door you know awesome the third door i looked that up I like, yeah i might have to check that great out. book uh, so you yourself, you have a podcast called uh, Temperature Check. Uh, do you want to talk? No, about the pod that? the podcast is Q and A with Che. The Temperature Check is just more of a just a music just a music show. You know what I mean? We just we share. You know, we play music and jam with it. Everybody submits music, and you know, it's like being able to play music from your peers. Sometimes you know, you, know, you get some industry professionals. You know, you might get a critique from me, but I also bring on some guest hosts as well to join me where, you know, you might get some A&Rs in the building or, or another big producer in the building. And we just, it's, it's, it's really just been a, a great thing through COVID for artists to be able to like share music with their peers and get feedback and comments. It's like a safe place, you know, no trolling. I, I don't allow any trolling, only, only positive criticism. You know what I mean? Only constructive criticism. That's dope. I, um, I just want to ask you about, you know, focusing more on your more production side of things. Like, I, I want to talk about, like, just the growth of of hip-hop artists to, like, full-fledged musicians. I want to use, like, Mac Miller, for example, of that. Somebody who mm -hmm. started out, like, being just a rapper. And then later on, especially with the last three releases, being almost like a full-fledged musician. And, and um, I want to talk about sort of that growth, like, like, like that, uh, like, what, uh, w let me just figure out what I have for a question here. Like, what? How do, how, do, how do you go from um, just, I guess, being like a one dimensional, like maybe this is my pocket to growing as an artist, to incorporating like instrumentation, um, working with different, you know, uh, uh, instruments and, and just different artists in general, you know, as getting out of your scope of comfort. Like, can you talk a little bit more about that and how you grew as an artist, maybe from your perspective? Well, I mean, that's growth and elevation, right? That goes back to what I was saying earlier about never stopping, you know, never settling, never, you know, continuing to learn and continue to stay hungry. I mean, Quincy Jones told me that at, you know, 86, 87, wherever he is, he's still out there, you know, learning, you know, discovering stuff and so on and so forth. So I think, well, first and foremost, learning an instrument is just going to make you a better, better music person, period. It's, it's going to make you, whether you whether you do rap, sing, whatever, produce, engineer, it's just going to make you better at your craft. Same thing, if you're a, a, a rapper or a singer, learning how to engineer some, 
you know, and understanding that is just going to make you better. So everything you can learn is just going to, you know, it's just like if you're a superhero and you just add, you know, you know, you level up and you get more skills. It's the same thing. Um, so I always suggest everybody learn as much as they can. Um, and, you know, because you want to build your weaknesses. But in terms of musicianship, I mean, that's one of the things that's part of what's going on in, in, in the music business right now, right? There's a lot of redundancy. There's a lot of mediocrity. And the one, the way that you level up out of that is you incorporate, you, you, you work with talented people. You know, you really, you collaborate, you know, and you continue to grow, you know, your music. IDK is a good example of that. He has a new album coming out and he's been doing that. And his new album sounds amazing. I think he's always had an awareness of that and he's always collaborated, but I think he's, he's starting to hit his stride. He's somebody that I think you'll see go from one level to another because of incorporating just the, the level of orchestration he's doing in the, in the, in the care. The, Cause I think it's just about, sometimes you just got to care more. You know what I mean? Like if you think of somebody like a Tyler, the creator, when it comes to his music, he just cares more. He cares about his music. He cares about the quality of what he's doing. You don't let the limitations. I think some artists just like, okay, cool. I got a beat. Let me just rap on this beat. And then that's the song. You know what I mean? And they, they don't challenge the producer or they don't bring, you know, they don't try to, you know, just bring more to the table. And I think you have to, you know, you have to collaborate. Singers, yeah, everything is a part of it. Vocalist, you know, I love strings. So I love working with people that, you know, do live strings and so on and so forth. So um, I personally am a little bit more adventurous than I think certain, certain people are because I think that's just, I didn't come from the cookie cutter sort of like, oh, let me make a hit like this. One, two, three equals four. You know, I was always, let me put a, you know, let me put a horn in, you know, I don't know if you've, familiar with Amalu, this young lady that's on Interscope, you know, I mean, I'm putting, horn, we're putting horns and it's a collaboration, which is great. I love working with an artist that can go there with you, but, you know, I'm putting horns in the verses and things like, you know, where you're not, where, you know, which is in the same register, you know, frequency range as a vocal. So that's something you would normally not do. You know, you just I break rules to try to make rules, you know? So but that's me. So not everybody, but I mean, my favorite artists are led that way. The Frank Ocean's, the, you know, the, you know, the Sampas of the world. Um, James Blake, Justin Vernon, Kanye West, you know, Dr. Dre, you know, they're always going to be just break rules or reinventing, you know, Dr. Dre for the, you know, in some instances, you could say he changed music three different times, you know. Um, who does that? You know what I mean? Like, who does, you know. So, I think you just have to be willing to put game. Same thing. It goes back to what I said earlier: getting out of your comfort zone. You know, that's how you make. That's how you make dope shit. Awesome. I think we just have a couple more questions, and uh, we'll let you go. So, thank you so much for for hanging with us. Oh, sure. Good. Um, I actually hit all the questions awesome. I have. I got I got one more for you. This is this is actually more for earlier in your career. This is back when you were working um, on Miss Education of Lauren Hill. Um, you had a, a big part of, of the creation of that album. I think you produced some like seven tracks on that. Um, mm -hmm. And you you also I think and this is this question is more geared towards young artists, most specifically again like the artists that watch this channel. Um, you were a young artist when you were part of that process. Obviously, that album is legendary, one of the best, greatest hip hop albums mm -hmm. of all time. Um, mm -hmm. But there was a business lesson there that was learned as well. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that and what advice you have for young artists who are first entering this business? Well, it's like any business, right? Whether you're in the drug business or you're in the stock business, know your business. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, not to dwell on something negative, but if you, you know, let's say we found some kid who's hustling, right? He could tell you all about his business. He could tell you his supply and his demand. He could tell you his competitors. He could tell you every you literally everything is about this so it, it the music business is one of those places where you'd be surprised how many people do not know their business they might know the basics but they, there's so much they don't know like you'll say hey like you know what kind of royalty you know what's your or what's your revisions in your publishing deal you know like you just ask some basic questions about different deals that they've entered and they can't and they can't answer it so going back to the lauren thing it was really just about information I mean, there was more to it than that, 
because obviously they were sort of negotiating against like who knew that she was never going to do another record. Um, so there was some of that mixed into it. But at the end of the day, I don't blame anybody else than myself because you couldn't take anything from Shape Hope now. So why did you, you know, why, why was something able to be taken from me then? And the only difference is information, the level of information that I know. So if I had informed myself, because information is power. So if I had informed myself more then, there's nothing that could have ever been taken from me. You know, so that's, so anybody getting into this business, I suggest you learn this business. You know? well, I hope that uh, you guys are listening out there because you dropped, uh, Shape Hope just dropped a lot of jewels, especially that last one. Um, uh, Shape Hope, thank you so much for joining us for the podcast. Uh, very awesome that I got to spend that last hour talking to you and getting your insight on a lot of different things. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you so much for everything. Uh, and for those okay. of you who are watching, make sure you like, you comment, you subscribe, you hit that bell button and you hit all. Um, definitely support us, share this out, and make sure that you're sharing this out to artists so that they can hear wonderful advice from uh, Shea Pope himself. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Shout out to Massachusetts in the building, you know what I mean? Appreciate Still awesome. got love for my, my city, you know? My, or my <laughs> state, in this case, too. Hell yeah. All right, uh, you guys take care, and best of luck with all your endeavors. Thank, Thank you. you, man. Thank you. Take care, man. All right, take care.